course, the first Guyana Speaks of the year. And you know, today we're very honoured to have John Agard um, here with Keith White, uh, Rosie McAndrew, and also Mark Matthew. Hi, come with me. Let's take a walk down my time tunnel. Hi there, Carl Brown here. It's good to be with you again. Yes, time for another trip down my time tunnel and welcome to my YouTube channel. Today I'm going to take a look. I have to do this program in two parts because we'll be looking at poetry, culture and storytellers. And I took time out over the last um, few days ago. The Guyana Speaks team. This is a program that's held a platform that's held every last Sunday of the month here in the United Kingdom, um, hosted by Juanita Cox Westmus and Rod Westmus at the Classic Club here in London. And they highlight various topics around Guyana and everything to do with Guyana. Um, not even so much politics, but from culture. Everything you could think of, music, art, it was really good. And this month for the first time the first edition they featured stories poetry and fables of guyana which was very interesting as a matter of fact um i will be featuring a number of these uh, programs um, hosted by the guyana speaks i'll be bringing that a lot on my youtube channel because i think it's something i need to look into a lot more culture i love culture and this program took on the likes of great names, looking back like Ken Corsby, John Agard, Wordsworth McAndrew, God bless him. And then you had Wordsworth McAndrew's white wife, Rosie McAndrew was there. Um, we had people like Mark Matthews of um, them too, along with Ken Corsby. Um, that was, there was a link with Ken Corsby, um, who worked along with Mark Matthews and uh, John Agard, and still around. Doris Harper Wills from the old school. I remember Doris from 1972, Cara Festa. And then looking back at some other names who I still think is alive and doing well and are really, really there. Francis Quammen of Faria. Remember him from The Tides and the Girl from Susan Berg. These are uh, radio serials that I used to listen to in the day. It was always bringing these people together. Um, Francis is not there. And Pauline Thomas. You remember Auntie Comsey? She too was, I, I researched and I, I had something about her. So when these names come up, it rings a bell. It brings you back to, wow, Ghana had a class. We still have um, a class of our own. We were really good in, in the world of poetry and culture and everything. We're dynamic. And so I thought that, gosh, you can't miss this one out at all. So I'm going to be looking at this production here on the Ghana Speaks of the stories, poetry, and fables of Ghana. And there are other people which I've been following recently now, even when I, I remember going back to the years of Theatre Guild. I, was at, I did attend Theatre Guild sometimes as well. I was in theatre. I'm looking back now with Desri Edgel and Margaret Lawrence. They've got this, the big girls, they've got this program on. So there's a lot happening in the world of culture. But going back to um, what we're doing now, looking at poetry, I will have to feature this gentleman, this stalwart, this great guy, John Agard. I cannot give John Agard just five minutes and, and say this is it. No. When you listen to people like John Agard and Mark Matthews, you have to you have to go the full whack. Then they start. This, you submerge yourself into poetry. If you, everyone is a, is a great poet. Everyone writes poetry. Of course you can, but it's the delivery and how it's well done. And a bit about John Egar. John did a book which he dedicated to his mom. Fantastic. A Rosary for Anna. Fantastic. And he did some poems from this book as well. And a little bit about John. John has written many collections of poetry for children and adults. And of course, if you didn't know much about him, he came to Britain in 1977 with his wife, the poet Grace Nichols. And in 2012, he was awarded the Queen's Gold Medal for Poetry. Now, that is a great achievement. Looking back at people like, um, we've got 
vibrant Cambridge. There are so much. Guyana is awash with culture and, and, and talent. But for now, I'm going to throw John at you. I need you to sit back, comfort yourself, make yourself comfortable, and absorb him. His delivery is pivot, is dynamic. Uh, when I was recording, John, I, you, you can't stop. You, you have to listen. So for now, I give you John Agard. To the importance of Guyana Speaks. It's a delight to be here on this January Sunday afternoon. We thank you for coming out. And I will do for you a selection of poems. But we don't want to deceive you with fake news. So even though Vanita said I'm collaborating with Keith, uh -oh. Keith will be doing a solo spot as a poet of the two. But we sure we we'll get the vibes. And we will do a collaboration for one of the poems. I want to begin with uh, three poems from a book I self-published for my mother called A Rosary for Anna. That name is pregnant with history. One, a Portuguese, Anna de Souza. I'm keeping in mind that that brilliant Guyana mind, Jan Kourou, was the first person said to me, to said to me, those names like de Souza, de Andrade, Fonseca, or Sephardic Jewish names. That's a fascinating strand of Caribbean history, which I can't touch on at this moment. A rosary for Anna, indicating not only the fact that um, she was a Roman Catholic, <coughs> but a rosary in the sense of that connecting of beads, the way sonnets are often connected. Now imagine a woman, a typical young Guyanese Portuguese woman, working in what was then British Guyana at Sproston's as a stenographer with her pitman and her shorthand, over 100 words a minute. Many of you in this audience might have experienced that pitman experience. But she was a Georgetown woman, in many ways a timid soul, never ever ventured from that Demerara River Stabrook market even to feeding poop. Didn't get her going on that boat. When she was offered holidays to Barbados, <coughs> she refused. She just didn't like traveling. So when she made that journey to England to live with us, my wife, a well-celebrated poet, Grace Nichols, and our daughter, Leslie, that was a major step. And her journey, she lived with us for 22 years. I am very <coughs> touched when English people living in the southeast of England tell me that through my mother's journey, they can see something of the wider picture, the wider diaspora of journeying to a country that was referred to as the mother country. I will begin with a poem called The Choice. I'm keeping in mind this Portuguese woman, Ana de Souza. Some of you might have known de Souza, a sweetie factory in Broad Street, Georgetown. First poem, The Choice. No more good morning, neighbor news from the beak of a yellow-breasted kiskadi. No foul cock fanfare from next door yard. Here is shiver and drown yourself in tea. No more kite spangled sky over a sea wall the Dutch built to brace or below sea level city <coughs> against the Atlantic's threatening bacchanal. No, not here. 
among the rolling Sussex dawns. Here, the ground can melt into slippery, white as if blessed with overnight salt, and the closest she'd ever come to snow was them made in England Christmas card. <laughs> Here the shops full to eye boggling overflow. But the red brick houses, them all look alike. Some buildings so tall is elevator or climb up steps till you drop. God, how she missed she bike. Yet, while the wheels of nostalgia still turn, she settles for the freeze, dresses sensibly warm for the wayward weather of the red, white, and blue. A Columbus in reverse calling old England new. Well, she loved icing cakes and making garlic pork. She became friends of the Portuguese. <laughs> and his pepper pot and all of that stuff. And I, as I write, this, as I read this title, I'm thinking of um, the wonderful Guyanese poet, Calypsonian Dave Martin, who deserves much wider projection and acknowledgement, a wonderful celebration of Guyanese culture through the voice of Dave Martin. He went to St. Stanislaus College, same school as me, all Roman Catholic boys. This is called in his tradition, Pancake Day, mustn't catch she without pancake turning golden brown in a bed of bubbling oil. Good Friday? Ain't no Good Friday without that cross of Calvary crossing itself on a homemade bun. And you know Christmas reach when the ginger beer set black cake rich in a baptism of rum. <laughs> the pepper pot, its own dark creek, brimful of Amerindian secrets, while the garlic pork in vinegar cast in time-eyed glances from inside a glass jar for a soon come festive fried down. His tradition, his tradition, and she don't have to look far for what? Right there on the shitong. Many of the Guyanese of my mother's generation, having migrated to England, <coughs> reflective of the wider diaspora, ask yourself why many Caribbean people don't like to eat mushrooms. <laughs> Very simple, <laughs> not rocket science. <laughs> In Guyana, we call mushroom <laughs> jumbi <laughs> umbrella. <laughs> but let me flash to the French Caribbean. You see, we are very locked into this monolingual stuff. But don't forget, we got a thing called French Caribbean. You're looking at Haiti, you're looking at Martinique and Guadeloupe. <coughs> Even Barbados calls it Doppy Parasol. <laughs> but I drink a lot of Guinness. People say I've got an Irish thing about me. I'm happy with that. They say I've also got a Middle Eastern look. I could be arrested if I was passing through Dubai. <laughs> you know, I don't mind. No. The Irish. The mushroom is also the toadstool, the home of the fairies. So we in the Caribbean, 
do have that supernatural connection to the mushroom. So imagine this Guyana woman living in England. She will have her fried eggs, she will have the baked beans, she will have the toast. Not me and that. <laughs> I ain't touching the mushroom. This one is called No Jumbie Umbrella. <coughs> Offer her a mushroom and she'll skin up her nose. For ghosts are known to congregate around mushrooms, so the story goes. Not a mushroom will cross her plate. No, the Anna of Guyana mushroom is Jumbi Umbrella. And in Barbados, folk call mushroom Dobby. Dob Dominicans say, Parasol Zombie. In keeping with their French ancestry, the Brits, especially the Irish, those mushroom rings point to fairies. The little people's property. According to the mobile, which should not be heard at this point. <laughs> And according to the tribe of Africa, the educated Dogons, a kid in time, you see a waffle. <laughs> <laughs> the Dogons knew about the star Sirius, the dog star, before the Western astrologers picked up on that. But let me get back to the text, now that that mobile is silent. <laughs> you see, I owe this type of skill <coughs> to my experience with the Alawi, the wonderful Guyana human being, and pioneering dramatist, Ken Corsby, the brilliant actor, raconteur, writer, Mark Machin, and the later addition, Ken Corsby, and then along come yours truly. And we had to improvise and all that type of stuff. You don't have to go to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. <laughs> all you got to do is check out the other way. Anyway, back to the text. According to the Dogon, mushroom ashes rubbed on a drum skin will make a drum articulate. For those of Bantu kin, mushrooms are souls incarnate while the Chinese take them to be heaven's cat of longevity. Looks like the sociologists might have missed a trick. Not citing the humble mushroom as a supernatural yardstick for measuring cultural transfusion. So let the Brits have their fry up Mushroom fix. Nothing will convince Anna of Guyana that mushroom ain't zombie umbrella. <laughs> Not me and that, she will tell you flat. No sorry. Not for she. No zombie brody. And I'm... Um, Eric has some books on sales, and I think Pete has some CVs. I might as well join the queue. <laughs> and um, I've got some of this book for sale, designed by uh, my mother's um, youngest granddaughter, Calero, who is at the back there. And we use, as a couple, Calero used a passport photograph, British Guyana profession stenographer. Now, I want to take you Guyanese back to a pregnant moment in history where we can rightfully claim global status. People are fascinated by this English-speaking Caribbean country, cricket-loving on the South American mainland. So you think of the Georgetown urban scene, but then you've got, our, don't forget, our wonderful visionary, Wilson Harris who explores the multi-textured layers of the rainforest mythos. But let me take you back to a forgotten moment. 
a young slave boy was rescued from what was then called British Guyana. He finds himself in Scotland on Lothian Street. Who does he meet as a neighbor? He meets the Darwin, Charles Darwin. This freed slave who has a name, John Edmund Stone. If you Google him, it might tell you Darwin met a freed black. Imagine Darwin, not so bothered about the academic of the university. He's gathering beetles, slugs, meets a freed black, as they say, named John Edmund Stone. He teaches Darwin the art of taxidermy. Think of that moment in time. Imagine those conversations. He recollects his adventures in the rainforest of Guyana. Fires Darwin's imagination. So when he goes off on the beagle, he has the skill of taxidermy. I read this poem about a year ago, and the lady said to me, do you know that Charles Waterton, who was a sensitive naturalist who visited South America and drew some tender drawings of the fauna and flora, imagine the young 12-year-old British Guyana freed slave brought to England by a sensitive journalist, not journalist, um, naturalist, Charles Waterton. Do you know what this woman says to me? She says, Charles Waterton married a Scottish woman by the name of Edmund Stone. And bearing in mind the random naming of slaves and freed slaves, I found that was an interesting bit of information. And I couldn't help writing a poem in the voice of John Edmund Stone. So when you think of Guyana in a global context, you couldn't find a more pregnant metaphor than a freed Guyana slave from British Guyana, as it was called, chatting with Darwin, the ascent of John Edmund Stone. My name rings no bell in the airs of science, but uh, footnotes know me well. Footnotes where history shows its true colors and passing reference is flesh. For I am John Edmund Stone, whose name is little known to evolution's white ladder. But Darwin will remember me. I just say, the black man who taught him Egypt's ancient art of taxidermy. To think that we should meet in Edinburgh, of all places, two doors apart on Lothian Street. No mention then of savage races. In those days, we were two bird stuffers. Mountain mortality in feathers. We were each other's missing link. Colleagues upright on a chain of being, a pair of wingless apes condemned to think. Darwin actually agreed to pay John Edmund Stone a guinea. That was the currency of those days of that horrific Atlantic trail. A guinea for the benefit of lessons in taxidermy. My <coughs> 90th birthday, by the inimitable Joyce Trotman, a preserver 
of our folklore and our proverbs especially. And I will do one poem from this book of Proverbs for children. Those of that generation will know when we went to school in the old colonial days, we had what's called the student's companion. We had the first aid in English. We had to join a circle. It was called take down. The teacher, the teacher points the way they came to you. She says, um, uh, you know, make hay if you're sharp while the sun shines. We didn't have a sunshine problem by the way. <laughs> And then you learn more haste, less speed. We absorb the English tradition, but we have our Caribbean folklore proverbs. The marriage of Europe, Africa, India, Amerindian genes pooled together in the inimitable and distinctive texture of our Caribbean Creole. And this is one I did for children. And this is called, not more haste, less speed, but hurry, hurry, make bad curry. <laughs> people rushing, people pushing, people shoving, people in a big haste, people in a big speed, not taking their time like a little seed. Why all the hurry? Why all the flurry? Why all the scurry? My granny tell me, Hurry, hurry, make bad curry. Let me hear you. Hurry, hurry, make bad curry. Hurry, hurry, make bad curry. Thank you for that. I want to leave time for that collaboration with Keith. It's spontaneous, by the way. Um, anything can happen. But out of my regard, what Guyana Speaks is doing yeah. in motivating a meeting of minds. I've never read this poem. It's a longish poem. I've never read it. First time I'm reading it. And I think today I would like to dedicate this poem one to the wonderful work being done by Guyana Speaks by Rod Westmus and Juanita Cox who is doing some wonderful work, a labor of love, and one of our pioneer writers, Edgar Metalalza, with special revelation of his connection to Oriental mysticism, very important. This poem is in fact a long poem written in about six parts in the voice of a flag. And I want to call every person in this room, and also those who, who are known creative artists, if I may coin an ex a word, the flag benders. And as I look around me, I mention Mark Matthews, you've got Doris Harperville's pioneering dancer, storyteller, you've got a Janice, a shine board. Grace Nichols, who in her eyes a long memory woman, explored the transatlantic connections in the voice of a slave woman. You've got, you know, Eric Huntley here, and people I might have missed out, Rosemary McAndrew, and um, of course Wordsworth, in exploring and keeping alive the vitality of Caribbean folklore. Dio Passat, who in his quiet way, was persevering in, in the field of uh, medicine, working for many years as a nurse in England. All of these various minds <coughs> have coalesced in Guyana. We are not afraid of what is called the Renaissance mind. Compartmentalization is threatened if you are let's say a multifaceted human being. You write poetry, you do that, you paint. This is not threatening to the Guyana global mind who can produce a Clive Lloyd to captain a very complicated web.
interesting these tea. This is not alien to the Guyana mind who can create a sunny ramful to handle diplomatic tensions. It's all gathered within the cocoon and the hammock vision of someone like Wilson Harris. To cut a long story short, this, po this poem, which I'm doing for the first time, and I dedicate it to you, is in the voice of a flag. And all those names I've called, I like to create an expression called the flag benders. You've heard of gender benders? Well, I would like to create an expression flag benders. Those minds who go beyond the confines of a flag to explore the global interstices of the imagination. And I can feel Wilson listening. <laughs> the poem is called When Every Flag Has Spoken. I've come a long way from ribbons on spears and garlands of feathers heading a fanfare of tribal others. Now, nations march to the grammar of my rectangles and squares, not to mention the odd triangle. On grand parades, you will see me displayed to the height of my glory, the center of ritual attention. But I stay calm and carry on. As any flag worth its weight in cloth would do, whether new, born, golden, arrow, head, or departing red, white, and blue, up a pole, down a pole, ever playing my starring role in the fabric of a nation's unfolding of what's known as independence. How I have danced in the neutral breeze for monarchs overseas and seen the colors of myself reshuffled for the long shackles about to step into their own stride, venting their own voice. Masa de Dun seems to resound from the very stone on which a toe stumbles, while ancient bones buried in plantation dust bide their time of healing. For I too have heard of that feeling called national pride <laughs> from the well-informed lips of the transatlantic winds that keep me flapping as well as up-to-date on history's shifting weight. Those winds that bring me tidings of risings and of risings of timely severings from a mother's country's absentee apron strings, a people defined by empire's still visible specter, 
rebirthing in their own mirror. And so at midnight's chime, I become a banner for a milestone beginning, hoisted skywards as a fluttering monument to the future. And when freedom tolls, see how I lord it over my stately pole to trumpet and drum roll. And in the reckoning hour when old rages grow mute, I command a multitude's salute and the speechless minute falls across the land. Oh, what would the United Nations, the Commonwealth, the Latin American Confederation, the Arab Emirates, in short, the globe, do without the likes of me and all my colorful kin. We whose silent tongue is flaunted in the wind. Therefore, unravel what hidden meaning you will from my flying geometry of colors. For there is more, there is more to the glint of the, the, the glint of ore in the promise of my goal. Much more than the murmur of night in the bold of my black. More than a waterfall signature in the fold of my white. More than a rainforest howl in the scroll of my green. More than a whisper of blood in the ripple of my red, history repeating its dead full mass. I am emblem of protocol and celebration, half mass. I am the drooping shroud of mass lamentation to you who wave me from the bonded crowd what words can a flag offer beyond the fervor of slogans that shadow my rainbow? Yet, since a flag knows how it feels to be thrown to the fury of flames, and I shall call no name. On behalf of every flag, I ask all of you who wave me to order. Am I the mere cloth you brandish to a marching creed basking in the vanquish? Or am I a nation's handkerchief? flown from a flagstaff of justice as democratic as sun and moon. It's only fitting I should end now, and I will forget that collaboration with Keith, which we will do at a future date if you watch this space, because I think I've taken enough time. Yes. And I will give the last word to the flag. Thank you very much.